looks like we're ready to get started. Welcome, everyone. And thank you for joining us, us today on this, or this evening, on maybe the most pleasant of weather nights. But <laughs> it just uh, goes to show where your heart is. So thank you very much for joining us. Tonight, we are celebrating service and volunteerism in the South Coast. And we're excited to have a very interesting program for you tonight. Um, and we just don't want to take up too much time talking about it. We're going to get right to it. I think you have a program. And um, my name is Deirdre Healy. I'm the Associate Director for the Center for Civic Engagement at UMass Dartmouth. And this is my fabulous colleague. Mary Song from Bristol Community College's Center for Civic Engagement. So Mary's going to kick us off a little bit um, with our interfaith call to service. And I'm just going to step over here and change the slide and we have a special guest who's going to join us. So do you want to say a few words? Uh, you were going to welcome the group and start. Yeah, okay, so here first. we go. Right, we're going to go right to our special guest. <laughs> Hello everyone. For over 200 years, Americans of all faith traditions have come together, put their shoulders to the wheel of history, and made this country what it is today. And I know that as we go forward, it's going to take all of us, Christian and Jew, Hindu and Muslim, believer and non-believer, to meet the challenges of the 21st century. As a Christian who became committed to the church while serving my community, I know that an act of service can unite people of all faiths, or even no faith, around a common purpose of helping those in need. In doing so, we can not only better our communities, we can build bridges of understanding between ourselves and our neighbors. That's why, through the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, we're launching the President's Interfaith Service Challenge for college campuses and the neighborhoods that surround them. It's a pretty simple idea, and you can learn all about it at whitehouse.gov slash interfaith service. We're challenging students, administrators, and citizens to work together on year-long service projects that strengthen their communities and unite people across religious and cultural lines. You might build houses together, or organize community-wide clothing or food drives, or dream up a new way to address an issue that affects your neighborhood. But one thing's clear. While we may not all believe the same things, and we don't have to, we can certainly agree that together we can make a difference. So I urge you to take up this interfaith service challenge and show once again that the values that unite us as Americans are far more powerful than those that divide us. Thank you, and God bless. And thank you. So we were pretty excited about the idea of joining this challenge because actually the goals are what South Coast serves and Bristol Community College has been all about for many years, is service and promoting social capital in the atmosphere of tolerance for everyone. So we are hoping that we'll be able to encourage everyone to do more service. Of course, you are the stars. We need to encourage other people too. And we um, want to really think about our beliefs and values more so than emphasis on the religious aspect. We're very excited about it. Dr. Matthew Roy and I were beginning uh, to face this challenge with over 250 other colleges across the country. So it, and he wouldn't, wasn't able to come here tonight because he had a death in his family or he wouldn't be here. So we have many superstars among us tonight. And um, I'd like to welcome Mayor John Mitchell, who's going to um, present a, a proclamation for us. Well, thank you, Deirdre. Thank you. Um, I feel really unlucky tonight that I have to follow Barack Obama in the <laughs> program. Uh, it's, it's, you know, as tough of an act to follow as, as anyone. But um, I, I would like to echo the message. And the message is that communities that thrive and communities that, that survive over time are ones in which its citizens, who don't necessarily have a, a formal role in government, come together to take on um, you know, the community's biggest challenges. And we've had a long history of that here in the city of New Bedford that goes back all the way to the whaling days uh, when we had guilds of coopers and blacksmiths and others who would come together to form uh, trade unions and, and, and speak on behalf of, uh, of those who um, you know, didn't have a voice. Um, we had the Underground Railroad here in New Bedford 
in the pre-Civil War era. There were those who spoke up on behalf of, of, of those who had escaped bondage in the South and uh, fought to find ways of integrating them into the community here. It went beyond that in our history. World War I was a big time in this city, and, and, the Red, and it was a time of suffering um, here. Many, many of our young men went off to fight in World War I, and many of, uh, many of our citizens uh, were lost to the Spanish flu pandemic. This is sort of an unheralded part of our history. But it was a time when the, the American Red Cross here in New Bedford really stepped up in a big way to bring the community together, to, to heal the wounds, to make few people feel better, and to make us a better community. And those traditions have carried on uh, over time with numerous civic groups uh, over, over the many decades. We, our challenges today are different. Um, our challenges surround, uh, often have to do with uh, the school system and you know, how it is that, uh, how can we as a community, not just teachers and principals and administrators and, and school committee members, but everybody, ensure that uh, our kids receive the best education uh, possible so that they can live out the American dream. These are the big challenges for, uh, for us today. Make sure that, that everybody has uh, three square meals a day, that they have a roof over their head, uh, that our community is clean, that we honor our history as we do in this building, uh, and that we come together to solve our big problems. We had a big hurricane last week, and there were numerous people who came out and volunteered uh, to, to make sure that folks were safe, that they uh, got in from the cold uh, and the rain and the elements, um, and to ensure that we got through it together. And that's what makes communities go. And so I really applaud you know, the effort of, of Deirdre uh, and Mary and UMass and BCC, as well as Reverend Lee and my friend, who's you know, as, as big of a champion of volunteerism as, as anybody in this community. Uh, Jack Sprague, the president of BCC, all of you, uh, when, when Kosh, uh, Operation Clean Sweep, an enormous success story in volunteerism in our city, these are the kinds of efforts that are necessary to make <coughs> our community a better place to be, one where people are connected, one where people have a sense of belonging to one another, one in which we can all uh, live out the American dream, and that's what we're all trying to do. But we're, none of us is an island unto ourselves. We've got, we're all in this together, and I suggest to you as someone who you know, has spent most of his adult career in public service that helping other people gives you a really good reason to get up in the morning. And so I know many of you have already bought into that gospel, and uh, our job is to spread that gospel and let people know that you can become a happier person and live a more fulfilling life if you're giving to others. Um, and I don't, there's really no other way to do it. So thank you for putting on this program tonight. I have, uh, I have a proclamation. I won't read through it. I think I covered just about everything. but. Um, but, uh, like I said, I congratulate you uh, on your efforts today, and uh, let's work together to, to build a better community. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will put this on our website. So, for those of you who want to take a good look at the proclamation, which is official, and um, it will be on our South Coast Service website, and we'll have it for you later on. Very today. good. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. For the uh, South Coast, for the President's Interfaith Community Service Challenge, we did have to identify some needs for service in our area. And several of the ones from the Kennedy Serve Act that we selected was poverty, education, energy, and environmental stewardship. So a lot of our activities this year will be around those needs in the communities. So now I'd like to introduce our <coughs> esteemed panelists. We're very excited and honored that they chose to come here tonight. And we've asked them to talk about why they serve in a panel called Why We Serve. Uh, and from their own personal perspective, they're champions of service, they role models of people who do service and inspirations to others. And we'd like to hear why is it that they serve, what are their beliefs and values that encourage them to do that. And I'd like to ask them to share a little bit about any contemporary service that they're doing at this present time. And so um, first, I'd like to introduce President John Sprager. Would you take your seat at the panel table, please? He's the president of Bristol Community College since 2000. And one of the first things he did when he came there was start a service learning program. 
And so we are one of the beginning institutions in this area that's had an award-winning program uh, right from the beginning of his uh, tenure here at BCC. And Reverend David Lima, would you please step right up? Thank you. And he is Executive Minister of the Interfaith Council, Church Council of Greater New Bedford since 2005, and Senior Pastor of the New Seasons Worship Center since 1993. And he's also an active South Coast Serves member as well, as BCC is too. And Maurice Sia. Um, Maurice is a student who's an AmeriCorps student service leader at Bristol Community College and he works in the Center for Civic Engagement at the present time and he's also the student representative for this uh, President's Interfaith Campus Community Challenge and he's uh, substituting for Dr. Roy tonight um, on our panel and it's a wonderful addition to have a young person uh, from the school on our panel as well. So thank you. And Marlene Pollock, she's a professor of history at Bristol Community College, who is currently serving for the fifth year on the New Bedford School Committee. And she is also co-founder of the Coalition for S Against Poverty and for Social Justice in this area. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with all of these people, including Marlene. And Reverend Ann Fox, of the Unitarian Universalist Society of Fairhaven and minister at the Unitarian Memorial Church since 2001. So, um, if I may, could I begin with President Sprague to ask you to say why you serve? Thank you. Mary. And why you're a champion of service? <laughs> well, thank you, Mary, and uh, uh, what a pleasure to be here and, uh, with this distinguished panel. I'm very honored to be with, uh, with these people. Uh, they have a long tradition of service. Uh, uh, when Mary asked me uh, to uh, participate, I wanted to think about uh, my own uh, long tradition of service, and uh, it's something that uh, I recall uh, from the being at the earliest age when uh, in the neighborhood and in the community uh, uh, instilled in me and the family uh, to serve and to uh, uh, to help uh, help neighbors and help uh, help out whatever we could. Uh, and I followed that through, uh, I come from a long tradition of it, as I mentioned. Uh, it's not necessarily faith-based as much as uh, uh, it's a belief and values uh, that uh, we, I have uh, cultivated or had instilled in me uh, throughout my life. Um, and it's something that came to fruition uh, before I arrived at Bristol, but certainly at Bristol Community College as president. I had the opportunity to, uh, uh, to make some uh, influential decisions about uh, service learning. Uh, and the reason I did, uh, a couple of reasons, uh, one is that the uh, community college mission calls for service to the community. I always uh, tease that uh, uh, community is our middle name at Bristol Community College, and <laughs> it is certainly a, a, a bulwark of our, of our mission. Uh, to serve the community, and uh, that has been the case uh, uh, throughout my career in community colleges. And the second uh, part of this uh, also stems from uh, uh, education, if you will, and that is that uh, I am a big proponent of uh, holistic education, that is, education for our students outside of the classroom as well as inside. And uh, I think that it enhances their uh, educational experience <coughs> at BCC. Uh, I approached uh, Mary uh, uh, and uh, Professor Zong was willing to uh, undertake this uh, uh, to get it started. We started from literally scratch, no budget, no people, uh, no anything, no office. Uh, and she has uh, been instrumental in building it. And I think uh, the key here is uh, that it is part of your education when you come to BCC. Uh, and uh, service to the community not only is it an institutional mission, but I like to refer to it as a student mission, individual student mission, uh, let alone the rest of us in the BCC family. Uh, we all have a part to play in service. So, Mary, uh, sometimes people get tired of hearing me say this, they've heard me say it over many, many years. But when I first started in service learning uh, uh, elsewhere and long ago, uh, back in the 80s, uh, 
the term, uh, we use civic engagement now, and I think that's much better. Uh, but uh, in those days, uh, what I liked about service-learning uh, was hyphenated, and uh, I used to uh, go on endlessly uh, about the importance of that hyphen, uh, that it linked uh, the learning experience for our students with the service. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I'm very happy that we're called civic engagement now, but I didn't want to lose the close tie that there is between service and learning uh, for our students as they as they move through the curriculum and uh, uh, gain a, a more stature at, at BCC and then beyond. I think that uh, if they haven't come to us with a uh, tradition of uh, service, and many have already, uh, from family or faith or uh, Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts or whatever uh, personal circumstances exist, I uh, like to say that uh, BCC has uh, instilled that, uh, that service commitment to in our students and has also uh, reinforced it, if you will, or enhanced it for those students who came uh, with that already in their being. Uh, so I think that's the uh, key that I have to uh, uh, emphasize the importance of civic engagement, let alone the value that this has to the nation, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the community uh, that we serve. Uh, I think that we're all uh, in this as uh, one you know, better off. Uh, the mayor said no man is an island, and uh, uh, this is a way to demonstrate vividly that uh, no person is an island, and uh, we need to uh, uh, work together and make this uh, uh, quite, a, uh, uh, quite a better uh, community that we live in. Uh, I think you heard echoes of that in the uh, post-election speeches, if you were staying up last night, uh, the night before, and uh, uh, it worked out okay and, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the importance of service and civic engagement. Uh, I saw that defeated candidates were saying the same thing at, in their post-mortem speeches as one of the victorious. So it's not it's not a party uh, uh, partisan uh, effort. It's a bipartisan. It's in our community. So I think that uh, handles what I was going to say. Thank, Thank you very much, President yeah. Sprague. Reverend Lena, would you like to have, tell us why you serve in the community? My father made me. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that. <laughs> Well, I, I, uh, I am the son of immigrants, and um, I got the opportunity to visit my grandparents back in uh, St. Michael Azores uh, when we were uh, first six and then uh, when I was 15. So it's been a couple of years since I've been back. I hear they have electricity in the village now, uh, but literally, uh, and, and no joking about how old I am, please, they didn't have electricity in my grandfather's village when I went at the age of 15, which is only 40 years ago. Um, everybody did everything together. And when we moved, when dad, mom, dad met here, got married here, uh, and we were being raised here in the Bedford, and I'm a lifelong resident of Bedford, I've lived my whole life here. Uh, they didn't know a word of English, and we moved into an all French neighborhood. There's nothing against the French, if there's anybody <laughs> French out there, okay? <coughs> but uh, there, we we suffered a little bit. My parents did from the 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 bit of prejudice moving into a neighborhood, being different, being new, uh, and we understood the English. My parents didn't always understand the English, and I used to get upset about some of the things that would get said in the neighborhood uh, about the greenhorns and and all that good stuff. But I watched my dad help our neighbors. Uh, I never had a lawn. Uh, everybody who's green in this country, uh, in this world, in this room will get excited about this. We never had a lawn in the north end of New Bedford. Not that there was a very big yard, but Dad had a garden from the sidewalk to the back, <laughs> and, and it just about everything was there. He helped neighbors put that up. When fences needed to be done, he helped neighbors do that. He offered to pay shares of doing that. He did things helping them, and I saw walls come down. And understanding, even across barriers, language barriers and everything else happened. So uh, I do credit my parents for instilling a, a, a work ethic and a volunteering ethic. Um, but I think it's a humanity ethic, quite frankly. And uh, 
as I've uh, matured and uh, grown and, and gotten to be a minister and uh, involved in the community, uh, that's only enhanced and, uh, and multiplied uh, as far as I'm concerned the efforts that, that should exist and uh, can exist if we work together. Um, Dr. Sprager mentioned uh, the post-mortems and, and I think some of them are still dead. But, uh, <laughs> but, but the fact of the matter is <clears throat> when we work together and we've seen it from the politics in Washington right through to the community, when people work together, they start to understand that their differences aren't so different. Their views may be, but we still care about the same things. When we work together, and this is why I believe volunteerism is so important and service is so important, when we work together, when we, when we dare to cross those barriers that we think separate us, to actually extend our hand to help someone else, to to give somebody uh, uh, just that respect do them to be able to give assistance, we come to realize that there's a lot more that we share and that helps make for a better community. I don't think, quite frankly, there's enough money that can be raised, whether you do it in taxes or, or anything else. Uh, millionaires that just drop dollars on our doorsteps, we're not going to be able to ever pay our way out of our problems. But when we work together, when we are able to offer our assistance, when, when there's a need and we all come together, like we've seen with uh, that which happens every time there's a major disaster in this nation, whether it's, it's always run the right way or not, it, it never seems to am ceases to amaze me the amount of people that are willing to come and offer help, come and offer supplies, come and offer dollars, because now we are not looking at our differences, we're looking at another fellow human being that needs assistance. So from anything that we're doing in the schools, in our churches, in our streets, those are the things that can really, really knit us and knit a community. I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that you're not living until you're giving, and I'm not gonna take an offering, uh, <laughs> but, but if you don't give of yourself, you don't really understand the things that you really, your mind can expand to. When you do, and sometimes it can be scary, but when you do, I'm telling you, and, and again, no disrespect to our professors and, and, and administrators, but I think that's where learning really takes place. And so it excites me when the schools, when UMD and, and BCC and, and, and even, you know, the, uh, the public schools, look to do service and include it in our education because that's when we apply what we learn and that's when we can really come to understand one another and that's why I serve. Thank you very much, Reverend Reese. And Maurice, would you like to tell us why you serve? Um, <clears throat> there's a number of reasons um, why I serve. Um, as others have said, um, you know, I grew up in a neighborhood where we all helped one another. Um, we were a close-knit neighborhood. If um, a neighbor needed help working on their house or fixing their roof or whatever, you know, we all came together, the neighborhood came together and, and helped that neighbor in need. Um, so I guess my service um, began then in, in early childhood and adolescence. Um, and I continued that through uh, my professional uh, career, you know, doing the, being the one that starts up the toy drives for Toys to Tots and the, the, you know, the collection of food for the holidays and whatnot. Um, but more recently, um, when I was laid off in 2007, um, I had the opportunity to begin attending Bristol Community College. and. Um, I was, uh, at the time I was collecting unemployment through Rhode Island and um, through an error I was, I found out that um, I wasn't going to be, be receiving um, unemployment benefits anymore. Um, and I found myself, and at the time, um, I was actually doing my first service learning with BCC. Um, I was working with the Bristol Elder Services 
uh, distributing food to the elderly in the community. And uh, suddenly I found myself on the receiving end of uh, the food pantries. And it was a very surreal experience to be brought up in an upper middle class <coughs> family, never expecting to um, find myself on the other side of the table, where I was always the one um, involved with, with giving and serving. Um, to find myself on the other side of the table was, was um, shocking, um, almost for myself. And you run the whole gamut of emotions when you're faced with that. And um, the people that um, I encountered while I was uh, visiting the food pantries um, were very helpful, very giving, non-judgmental, um, just wanting to help, you know, pure heart. And um, that's really the reason why I'm serving today, I think. Um, just because of the experiences that that um, I had having to go to um, finding myself on the other end of the, the food pantry, um, having to receive. And um, so now, what are you doing now? Working with the interfaith. Yeah, Thanks. now with the interfaith uh, challenge, um, I've begun working with the uh, the food pantries in Fall River. Um, I've been in contact with United Neighbors, and uh, I've been told that the food pantries in Fall River are beginning to work together. Um, and I'm very excited to be uh, I was invited to be a part of that, um, so that they can serve all of the community to the best of their ability, um, to make sure that everyone gets enough food that they need, um, so that children are going to be hungry. <laughs> Um, so that the mom that's working the third shift can get to the food pantry and, and guess what, there's going to be food available for her uh, to take home to her children. Um, so I'm very excited to be working um, along those lines. Thank you very much, Maurice. We're happy you're working with us too. Professor Pollock, why do you serve? <coughs> Uh, well, <clears throat> I actually grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and I'm the daughter of Jewish parents growing up in the 50s, right after the Holocaust, and um, I think that had a huge impact on my life, you know, trying to figure out how, how in the world this could happen, how could all these innocent people be slaughtered so systematically. And my mother was very... Uh, she always uh, uh, billed herself as an English major, but really she was a historian. And when I was, um, one day I was walking around the campus in Fall River and I realized, wait a minute, she wasn't really an English major, she was a historian. <laughs> because she would always uh, talk about how this could happen and how the Jewish people had become the scapegoat in Europe and how uh, the, um, I don't, I don't remember if she actually talked about divide and conquer uh, or whether I learned that later, but so I, I felt like she gave me right away sort of a sophisticated analysis of what had happened. And as I was um, getting older, of course, on TV was the Civil Rights Movement and Martin Luther King and all these ordinary folks, uh, you know, sitting down, and I know a lot of the older people in the audience will remember uh, the nonviolent civil disobedience that was going on, and, and especially in the North, I mean, everybody's heart went out to the black community, and, and for me, it was an incredibly riveting experience. And I, I, I realized that the, uh, the, the African Americans were the Jews of America. In other words, this was the group that was going to be vilified, of course, you know, ghetto back in Europe and now ghetto in the United States. And because I always loved history, I was familiar with slavery and Jim Crow segregation. And so to watch on TV this incredibly powerful mass movement uh, that was victorious really, really riveted me. And, and so um, I remember I, when I was in college, my first actual protest was the night that Martin Luther King got assassinated. And at the same time that that was going on, the, of course, the anti-war movement was really uh, emerging. And <clears throat> so I actually uh, moved from, I was at the University of Michigan 
and there was an anti-war movement there, but I didn't know where it was. <laughs> so I wanted to come to the East because I saw these anti-war marches on television, and uh, you know, proceeded to be involved in that, and again saw you know millions of people demonstrating, protesting making a difference, changing things. And I think not only as a person who was Jewish, but also as a woman, I felt uh, that that stirring or that feeling of um, being left out or sidelined. So I really identified with, with all of the movements that were coming forward of the, of the people who were, who were um, not being given a fair shake. And so for me, <coughs> Uh, I always identified my service as being part of a mass movement, and I think um, that led me in my his <laughs> that led me in my historical research to be much more interested in social history. In other words, what were the ordinary folks doing, and how did they shape history? Because uh, you know historians vary in, in terms of what they're interested in. They're interested in you know the elites or the intellectuals or you know the the people who wrote things, but but because of being shaped by these massive movements that really made a difference, that really changed people's lives, um, I, I started to study that, being fortunate enough to, to be able to work at Bristol Community College. Um, and uh, so I, I had this great sense of justice and uh, feelings against unfairness and wanting to make a difference. And, and um, so in terms of forming um, the coalitions, um, being involved in these mass movements, we had heard in, you know, and, and I was at BCC at the time, and we had about a thousand, almost a thousand, uh, mostly women, but some men on welfare, uh, being able to go to college and get their degree. And at that time, you know, you could also um, get your bachelor's degree, transfer to Mass Dartmouth, which a lot of people were doing. And uh, in the mid-90s, there was this horrendous antipathy against welfare moms, you know. And, and again, you know, the, the same messages are playing in my mind, you know, scapegoat a specific group, uh, put all your hatred on this group, divide and conquer, and then, uh, you know, somehow everybody feels good. So, so uh, my husband and I decided to form this group called the Coalition Against Poverty. I actually have to give credit to my husband. He was the one that did it. He had a lot of welfare moms in his sociology class. And so these women came together. And we had heard, because we had a lot of connections with the Boston movement, that um, Governor Weld at the time really wanted to throw all these women off welfare in 60 days. And we, of course, knew, you know, it's very easy to stereotype uh, people. But we knew these folks, and we knew how hard it was as single moms and single dads with no money to, and how hard they worked to struggle through to get their degree so that they could give their family a better life. And so we sprung into action, formed this group, and quickly realized that, that uh, the sentiment in the state was so hostile towards people on welfare that what we, would, what we needed to do was uh, move over to what we call a working family agenda. Okay, if you want to kick all these people on welfare, then we need affordable child care, we need affordable health care, we need affordable housing. Because literally, if you're off welfare, you're in worse shape if you're in poverty than if you're on welfare. I mean, we should get the subsidies, uh, you get the health care, you get the daycare. So, um, so that's what we, we developed, a working family agenda. And then right after that, um, we saw the situation in Washington change, uh, uh, as far as we were concerned, in a worse direction. Uh, very conservative. There was the contract, we call it the contract on America, the contract for America, which sought to cut uh, the, you know, the money for, for social programs. And so together we formed the Coalition for Social Justice with other concerned people. And so um, the Coalition for Social Justice was, was set up to fight at a national level, and uh, we did do that. We fought against the balanced budget amendment because uh, literally it would have balanced the budget on the backs of low-income people, played a big role in defeating that, and then, and then very quickly realized that because we had Jim McGovern and Barney Frank that they, would, they could fight for us at the national level, so the two coalitions began to fight together to have a working family agenda. And, 
actually one of the big successes we had right away, and it happened at BCC, was the fight for affordable daycare. We had invited all our state uh, representatives to come to a meeting at the <coughs> college. We had uh, people testifying, and we had a very broad coalition. Mass Senior Action was involved, labor unions were involved, and so we had about 250 people in the audience. And, and ask the representatives to listen to the stories of real people. In other words, you can stereotype and you can talk about generalities, <coughs> but when you know people um, in low-income situations really struggling, you're, you know, you can't help but be, uh, unless you're very hard-hearted, very sympathetic. And we were able that year, because of the work that we did with uh, our representatives down in Southeastern Mass and also representatives across the state with other organizations, to win the first big increase in affordable child care of $100 million. So when you have that kind of success, um, you, you attract more and more people because people feel, uh, I think they want to serve, but I think people feel sometimes it's hopeless that you can't really change things. Uh, so we try to emphasize, we try to focus on things that are, um, that we can win, that we can uh, make progress on because people have so many defeats that you know you certainly don't want to fight for something and they're getting defeated. By the way, we did a lot of work. The Coalition for Social Justice can work on elections. So I was very happy that we, we worked uh, for candidates that support uh, struggling working families. You know, and all these, and a lot of, most of the people that we work with are struggling working families and they felt so excited, so empowered, so happy and you know now want to do more and more and more and then just segue to the school committee uh, the reason I'm, I ran for school committee was because um, both my children went through New Bedford schools I always felt that the school system could do much better um, I think a lot of the urban schools school districts uh, fail us in many ways and um, so not to go into all the details, but uh, I was able to run and get elected. I'm now in my second term and uh, try, you know, building coalitions with especially uh, students. We have a lot of Latino students and, K and Cape Verdean immigrants who cannot speak um, English coming into the system and uh, their parents, you know, like what you were saying, can't speak to their teachers or their principals trying to, to fight for more bilingual uh, employees in the school system. Uh, trying to um, mobilize people. I mean, I feel like this is our country and our folks need to, to uh, get involved, but I've learned that people will get involved if they feel that, that there's a chance that they can win. You know, so that's my story. Thank you very much, Molly. And Reverend Fox, would you like to tell us why you serve? Well, the roots of my service um, really go back to my uh, childhood um, in England. Um, I grew up in the shadow of World War II, and um, no one had much of anything in those days. And I, I, my most vivid memories are of how, how much people helped one another. Um, people of all classes, all walks of life, were thrown together living in similar neighborhoods. And I saw people organizing um, events, uh, festivals that everyone could participate in. Um, it's one of the most vivid things that I, that's bringing people together. I was fortunate enough to have an uncle who, um, he was a black man, um, married to my father's sister, and he became, he was very oriented towards public service. And he began um, a, <coughs> a lads and hijads club. And that might seem like a, an odd thing to start, but his feeling was that there was nowhere where uh, people could come together to play games, to have sports, things like that. If that lads and dads club is still going on today, and he's dead um, a decade, uh, has passed away a decade ago. Um, so that's, that's what I remembered, how when people helped each other, it just seemed like there was more joy around. That's for sure. And when I came over here, the um, Vietnam War was going on, and the women's movement was underway. I thought it was the most exciting place on earth, <laughs> and it was actually, this time. Um, I actually was teaching uh, in uh, Harlem at the time, and I think at that time we didn't know how to help. It was such a big, big movement. 
we didn't know how to help. And I was fortunate enough to uh, teach in a school where um, there was a lot of money being poured in to uh, help kids get up to speed on reading, that sort of thing. So that really stimulated my social uh, conscience, I believe. Um, many years later, I went into the ministry and, um, well, even before then, it was um, the minister who um, invited us to march with him in a, uh, to save Laguna Canyon. This was in California. Save Laguna Canyon. And I remember marching with my daughter and him shoulder to shoulder to save Laguna Canyon. So this was just, it was really the beginning of the Echo Justice Movement. And I saw that, and uh, forming coalitions with others, um, never dreaming that my own daughter would join a very radical group called Earth First. <laughs> and within a few months, I saw her on the television, <laughs> chained to a bulldozer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so when I became a minister, I saw, I, I felt like the, the most wonderful thing in the world is not to just navel gaze and improve yourself spiritually, that's nice, but how do you express um, in the world uh, your beliefs that for the um, worth and dignity of all people? And really that's what motivates me more than anything. And I think it does with people in my congregation. I don't just mean in my congregation, I'm sure in all your congregations it does too. So we, we um, offer opportunities for people to, um, and we, have, we sometimes have people come speaking our pulpit about their various things that they do. Marlene came once to talk about social justice and told us her story, and somebody from uh, Shepherd's Pantry came, and somebody from a Gifts to Give program. I don't know if you're aware of that. Um, they do wonderful uh, work. And families from our congregation actually go to Gifts to Give to um, to help, and they don't just go once or twice. I think it's on a regular basis that they go. And I see the differences in these people. They're doing things as a family and helping others. It changes <coughs> us. It changes us. I think it, um, we, we see our common humanity in one, one another when we help one another. And there's joy in that, a lot of joy. So um, I think that's why, why we live to serve one another. It's a more modest story than my, um, my <laughs> colleagues here, but that's the truth for me. It really is, and I want to thank everybody on the panel. We can see how passionate you are about service. We're grateful that you came to share with us, and I'm hoping that you'll inspire everybody to work with you. Uh, in the community, and our goal is to get people from different churches, different communities, different colleges working together uh, to solve a problem. As you mentioned, you do it gives to give, which uh, is a member of self host Service as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So if our panelists would like to take your seat, we'll move on to the next part of our program. I hope that people are getting the sense, I, I was kind of joking around, but I actually think it's true that um, our panelists may have told us in ways that um, service will not only make you successful academically, but will also ensure your afterlife in heaven. <laughs> that's, that's part two of the service. <laughs> So we're um, now I'm going to ask Jen Belay from um, also from BCC Center for Civic Engagement to join us while we celebrate our um, South Coast Serves Volunteer Superstar. So among us, um, we have some people that we'd like to recognize for their good work in the region. They have been selected through members of our South Coast Serve Collaborative, and they're with us tonight, and we just want to let them know that we're grateful and thankful for the good work they do. Did you want to pass these out? Sure. Okay. So our first um, superstar is Taylor Kinsler, and um, first, allow me to apologize if I don't say your name properly, just let me know. <laughs> um, Taylor is from Lakeville, and she spent her year as Miss Massachusetts in 2012 traveling the state and working to raise funds and awareness for the Children's Miracle Network and programs across the country. 
Taylor will also travel the state speaking to high school students promoting her personal platform, Give the Gift of You, Volunteer, a nonprofit initiative aimed at inspiring young people to volunteer. She was nominated by the United Way of Greater New Bedford. So Taylor, so Taylor we have a certificate yeah. for you. And all of these folks were identified by members of South Coast Serves as being their superstars, and they've provided invaluable service to help these organizations over the past year. So our next um, superstar is B. Escalante. She is an Ocean Explorium volunteer since May 2010, and she has amassed over 1,700 hours of service, assisting with the missions, the gift shop departments. Um, over the course of her service with the Ocean Explorium, B has been responsible for performing a variety of um, service opportunities, including training, new volunteers, helping with the Ocean Explorium field trips, and she's an active participant at um, the Ocean Explorium volunteer meetings. Her voice has been a strong, um, has been strong instrumental in influencing change within the volunteer program. So is B here? B could not okay. be with us tonight. Okay, so our next volunteer superstar is Jennifer Velarde, is that how you pronounce it? Okay. She is um, with the Community Economic Development Center of Southeastern Mass. She is a native of Ecuador and a recent UMass Dartmouth Law School graduate and former AmeriCorps member. She always goes the extra mile to help an immigrant family in need. Jennifer's work has reunited more than a dozen families over the past year, helped immigrant students find a pathway to college, in better future, placing students in English classes and found um, justice for workers who face discrimination in the workplace. Her energy, her heart, and dedication makes her a clear choice as a volunteer superstar. Now our next volunteer superstar is Samantha Smith, and Samantha began volunteering with the Buzzards Bay Coalition in February 2012. Since then, she has worked with the development team, the education team, the advocacy team, as well as the special events um, program. Samantha's ability to perform tasks as directed is exemplary, and her strong capabilities led her to managing the WH Outreach um, Center independently for the summer. Her attention to detail, friendly disposition, and well-rounded skills makes her a valuable asset to the organization and a joy to be around. Samantha is a sophomore um, Endeavor Scholar at UMass Dartmouth. And Samantha Congratulations. And then our next superstar is Phil Arcoat. Yes. That? Okay. <laughs> Phil Arcoat. Um, Phil is a volunteer who has stepped up to the plate with his enthusiasm and talent. Phil has proven to be a steadfast and reliable event um, volunteer who can, depend, who can be depended upon to carry out requested tasks with vigor. Phil takes, um, takes on event even the most challenging tasks in a positive and friendly manner. He is a valuable asset to Buzzards Bay Coalition and a superstar volunteer in the South Coast region. Thank you. And our next um, volunteer superstar is one of BCC's own, um, Joanne Fields. Joanne is a BCC community college um, community service leader and a recipient of the President's Volunteer Service Award. She has performed over 502 hours of service throughout the past year, volunteering for various campus and local events, including the New Bedford Working Waterfront Festival and the Greater New Bedford Summer Fest. One of her, her, her favorite service activities is the Teddy Ministry, where teddy bears are blessed and then distributed um, by her church to comfort individuals who have lost a loved one. And then next we have two um, outstanding superstars, Victor, Tom Kowitz and, <laughs> and John Lee. Um, both are 
individuals, uh, they're both new to the YMCA Share the Harvest program this year, but they have been great workers consistently. They have demonstrated their passion and devotion through reliability, hard work, natural leadership, all while maintaining positive and inquisitive attitude. Unsurprisingly, their similarities do not end with their work ethic. Victor and John are both juniors at UMass Dartmouth and, have, and are both engineering majors, are both in engi um, studying engineering, civil and mechanical respectively. Each found their way to UMass Dartmouth following their desire to achieve greatly, coupled with their high reputation the university holds in the, in the engineering fields. And those are our superstars, so congratulations. <laughs> So next I wanted to move on to recognize um, the AmeriCorps and Commonwealth Corps members who are serving in our community. You know, sometimes um, people are maybe slightly confused about how to distinguish service and volunteerism. So we like to think about service sometimes as when people make an extraordinary commitment to a length of time and for that commitment they are um, compensated in some way. So in the case of AmeriCorps, AmeriCorps members receive an education award at the end of their service, similar to the GI Bill, which may help them further their education or to um, pay, repay some student loans. And Commonwealth Corps offer similar um, benefits. So they are making a tremendous commitment to our community because all our service members serve um, on a very low budget. So they're with us for a time, um, pretty much on their own time. So um, you can see that we actually have many members serving in our region, and I'd like them all to stand right now so we can thank them. that is on the uh, back table and we'd like to you to take that home with you tonight. So we're coming to the end of our program and this is maybe the most exciting part of the night, although this has been exciting altogether, I think. Um, so we would like to today kick off our South Coast Serves 60. And it's asking individuals to, to do 60 hours of service. and. Um, Whenever they take on the challenge, we are happy this has no definite time when you have to start, like it doesn't have to be the beginning of the year or the beginning of the school year. Um, so we challenge people at any time to take on this um, particular pledge. And with us tonight, we have two young women who are from our sister school who are taking on that pledge. So if you could stand, please. member and the volunteer coordinator at our sister school to introduce our young women please. So we have Maria and Linnea and all girls at our sister school are required to do 15 hours of service each year because we really value giving back to the community but both of these girls have already blown those hours out of the water and have accepted the challenge because they care a whole lot you know both of them have worked with kids and um, with environmental cleanups and all sorts of things and they're fantastic and I'm so so excited that they're taking on this challenge and as middle schoolers that's huge so expect really big things from these two and so I hope that next year at this time we're going to see your pictures up here and we're going to be honoring you as our volunteer superstars so thank you again So we've come to the end of our program, and I'd just like to thank everyone for being here and thank the members of South Coast Serves. We've been mentioning South Coast Serves a couple of times now, and um, just to remind you that we are a collaborative of many different organizations 
who are working on building the infrastructure for service and volunteerism in the region. For sure, this is work that cannot be done alone. We need to work together and in partnership to make all these great things happen and to ensure the future for our community. So thank you once again for joining us. Thank you for our panelists. Thank you for our superstars. Thank you our AmeriCorps and Commonwealth Corps members. And for our pledgers, see you next year. Thank you.